was that about exactly? I, I have like. I oh, have the ADL people. article was about um, the alt right and the alt light and stuff like that, and they're finally catching on to a lot of the final points. But that's beside the point. We're starting with. Um, I'll get to that, but that's a very brief thing. But we'll, let's discuss the. Um, what was it? The hundred uh, questions about fascism. Yeah, have you have you actually uh, read it? Or no? I haven't read it, but well, I haven't read it in its entirety. I've read um, the sections that weren't specific to Brit British issues at the time. Right. I mean, the first twenty or thirty questions. That's really what I have in my head right now. Um, they're completely just related to like fascism as an ideology, not so much Britain. And then everything after, like, question 50 is, like, 90% about, um, 90% about Britain, so, uh, yeah, alright, we can talk about that. Yeah, alright, so, uh, where are we starting here, because I got it pulled up now. Oh, perfect, Thanks okay. Thanks, a free PDF online, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I have the book right in front of me, so, if we need to reference something, I have it. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, have you started recording, or no? Yeah, it's recording. Okay. Um, so I guess we should do some kind of uh, introduction. Uh, all right. You want to just like do a countdown and then we'll start? Oh, we're starting now. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, hey, I've been recording so, for about the past uh, two minutes. Doing? How you been? <laughs> uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, sickly, but I guess that's allergies. Yeah. Um, it's that time of the year. Yes. Um, so... Uh, Today's topic, what did you have in mind there, friend? Uh, besides the uh, recent events, not much. <laughs> <coughs> well, what exactly happened in recent memory? I mean, there's a couple of things, you know. Um, there was well, this uh, ADL article. That ADL article, of course, which yeah. is semi-important, not necessarily that important, but it uh, did give me an idea. Uh, we'll discuss that later. Um... There's the resignation of uh, Sean Spicer. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm hoping the guys on Fashion Nation can discuss that better than we can because it seems really fishy because he resigned over a recent appointment that Trump made. I'd yeah. like to know if this is bad news or good news because I don't think he was a very good uh, press secretary, to be honest. Do you think it was kind of like a Comey situation? I don't know. I mean, you know... I heard a lot of neocons calling for his head too. So, I don't know. Like, how, how does the how does the collective right feel about that? I don't know. I think everybody's really curious about this new guy that came in. I'm gonna have to look into that. Um, Sean Spicer resigns. I'm currently googling that. I can't I can't pronounce this dude's name. He's like <laughs> some sort of Italian name. And it's dude. Is it even white anymore? Oh yeah. Do what? Dude, are Italians white? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just have really strange names. Ah, here it is. Uh, according to New York Times, Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, resigned Friday after telling President Trump he vehemently disagreed with his appointment of Anthony... Here we go. What Why the hell? Back, no, <laughs> <double caramel. laughs> what the fuck is that, dude? Uh, it's the inevitable fucking ad that pops up every time on these websites. Oh, shit. Ow, the edge. It sounded like that, um, <laughs> oh, what's it, like that piracy commercial? You wouldn't pirate it. You wouldn't steal a car. You wouldn't yeah. steal a purse. So why are you stealing shit online, kid? Exactly. Oh, man. That was pretty good, dude. Uh, anyway, um, it, was, it has to do with the appointment of a guy named Anthony Scaramucci. Scaramucci? Scaramucci? Scaramouche. Scaramucci. Right? Scaramucci. That's an I at the end. So I always like, thought it was Scaramucci. Oh, Scaramucci. Sc Scaramucci. I don't know. It's definitely Italian. A New York financier. Uh-oh. That's good. As his new com communications director. Well, that has nothing to do with press secretary. So why is he so upset about this? Could not tell you. Oh, boy. Well, maybe, um... Maybe we'll find out in a few days, but this guy's, um, he got his started. The new guy got his, uh, start at, uh, Goldman Sachs, and then from oh, there... Oh, great, dude. Oh, great, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's always a good sign. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love it when my politicians work for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck. Oh, no. You're, uh, breaking up a little bit there. Oh, am I? Yeah. Do you, uh, you still hear me? Yeah, I still hear you. Perfect. Okay, yeah. Everything, I don't know, I'm gonna 
catastrophic that is their sound, but, um... Yeah, he's still breaking up a little bit. God fucking damn it. Um, is it... Hmm. I don't know, I mean... How about now? I mean, I'm trying to load an article and send it, and I might have to do it. Yeah, you might have to hang up and, re- and call again real quick. Alright. All right, so uh, we're going to probably move on to the 100 questions about fascism answered by Oswald Mo- Mosley. But first, we need to get um, KK back on the call. Maybe I should be the one to call this time. Yes, we're using Skype. It's... Uh, not the best thing in the world, but it could work. Okay. Um. You there? You there? No. All right. Uh, <coughs> All right. So we a yep. of technical difficulties there. Yeah, I think I'll edit this out. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, go for it. Yeah. All right. So uh, we are back here with the hundred and what was it a hundred questions answered about fascism by Oswald Mosley yeah that's correct Um, that is a book that I recently picked up I mean it's kind of hard to call it a book I mean it's no more than like 50 pages I mean it's practically a pamphlet (laughs) yeah it's basically a pamphlet from what I can tell Um, and this was a Piece of work written by Oswald Mosley that was presented to, I believe, like British audiences back in the 30s, like pre-war um, Britain, uh, and it was basically addressing a um, hundred questions that uh, <coughs> people would usually ask Mosley. So he uh, compiled a list of them and put them in a book. Um, and just looking at it, I mean, like if you like, kind of listen to the uh, I guess, tone of the book. It's very, uh, I'd say, confident and um, very, I mean, it's pretty critical of the two-party system. Um, And if you know anything about Mosley, he was a politician for a while. Um, And after taking a tour around Europe and learning a little bit about fascism, just convinced that it was the way to go. So, um, yeah, I mean, since then, he had had a pretty successful time until the World War (coughs) started. Um, so when the world, just, my understanding yeah. is that when the World War started, a lot of his people, sometime between then and the end of the war, were arrested and in some cases executed. Oh, for, for sure, two, yeah. yeah. No, they were they were definitely arrested. And I'm not sure about executed, but I know for a fact that a lot of them were rounded up. And I mean, Mosley spent that entire time in jail. So mm-hmm. uh, he had a couple of interviews afterwards. Um, I was watching one that was like. 70s, and I mean, he still, I think he still held a lot of those beliefs. Oh, yeah, he held on to quite a bit. I think he was in favor of the European Union, however. Oh, yeah, no, if you listen to some of his older speeches, he always talked about, um, you know, ceasing the Brother Wars and starting a, a new Europe, a, a superpower Europe, <coughs> you know? So, uh, in theory, the European Union seemed to provide a lot of that. He certainly wanted something similar to that. I don't, I don't think he would put, like, where it's gone, but... <laughs> the Jewish direction that it's gone in. Yeah, I don't think he would um. appreciate the way <laughs> things have gone, but he would probably... Yeah, I think he probably would have liked something a little more... I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how he wanted the Euro- his European Union to work, but he, yeah. He I think he just wanted a united Europe. <coughs> I mean, he wanted sort of a melting pot of European culture and identity, and having them work as one single unit. I'm assuming a fascist unit, um, but sort of on a continental scale, you know? Yeah. Like, in each individual state acting as one piece of the uh, the larger fascists, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at a couple of the questions, um, I was just looking at, which one was it? Uh, number 44, do you favor a return to the gold standard? And this is my favorite one. No, gold is a fetish used for its own purposes by international finance. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, that, like, the thing that I could think of was, like, that really um, blurry image of, like, a Jew. Like, you know, the happy merchant guy. International finance is basically just code word for the for Jew. Them. Yeah. Echo, echo, echo. Yeah, for them, the echoes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and I mean, like, the first couple of questions are pretty straightforward. Um, let's see. Um, like, why do you use the fascist? Why do you wear a black shirt? Um, there's a couple things. And I mean, um, and I feel like, let's see, um, I'm just looking through this, uh, he had, he seemed to have an interesting view on the National Socialist Party at the time, um, that it was... That it was uh, purely fascist, but what made it um, fascism was that, like that, what made it, what kept it fascism rather than national socialism being its own entirely different thing, uh, was that it was German, and like that each uh, country would develop its own fascist identity, so to speak. Exactly, because you can't really, um, you can't just import one ideology from one country right. to another. Right, and I see a lot of like national socialists <laughs> in America today, and. I, I don't know if that's ever really going to take root with normal people. I almost feel like it's like normies, for example. I, I don't I don't think it's ever gonna catch on with them, I guess. It's, if it is, it's gonna have to be rebranded, it's gonna have to have a new name, a new, new look to it, new symbolism. Uh it's gonna have to be very Americanized and it's gonna have to fit the American ethos if it's going to if it's gonna yeah, get I mean, anywhere. I mean, you know, like, you, you know, I mean, you can still have those sympathies, like, oh, like, I love National Socialism, but, like, um, it, it's just not, I don't I don't think it's going to happen here, I mean, as much as you'd like it to. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, this, <laughs> that's just speculation. I mean, like, I three mean, years ago. You don't know what the world's going to look like in 30 years. That's <laughs> Three years ago, if you told somebody that Donald Trump would be president, I don't Yeah, know. they would probably laugh in your face. Yeah, they'd yeah. have laughed at people's faces over it, and yeah, it did happen, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, dude, Trump became president. I mean, like, I remember back in, like, 2012, whenever Trump was hinting at running the first time, or b multiple times, he, I think that was probably his second or third hint that he was going to run, and I was like, okay, well, anything's better than Obama, and somebody basically just laughed at me, and they never thought that it was possible that he would ever run or even win, but he did it, I, but anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I think everyone's said this a hundred times, but I think it's just that... Uh, a kick in the nose to the system that's been shoving all this shit down your throat for the last uh, maybe two or three decades, you know? Yeah. And I say this, I mean, you know, the uh, the conditioning against um, whites and their own interests, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, when people say, like, fascism is a dictatorship or it's totalitarian, I mean, like, if you look at question 15 um, in the book, uh, they'll say, like, the the question is, what about dictatorship? And I mean, um, that seems to be a big concern for a lot of people, you know, like, well, you know, if you have fascism, it's the most authoritarian and totalitarian thing. You're going to have no privacy and, you know, every facet of your life is going to be monitored. And I mean, that's already kind of the case in democracy. So, yeah, uh, I'm, looking at, not I'm looking at it now. I like his wording here. He says the fascist movie represents leadership, not tyranny. He's trying to draw a distinction. <laughs> He's trying to draw a distinction here, and he's basically making the point that it's about the people's will, for one thing, and it's supposed like to be there, there's a, Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like there's a large difference between, um, like, you know, totalitarianism for the sake of totalitarianism. Like, yeah. just, like, I want to control people, and then there's, and then there's like, actual leadership where it's, like, I'm trying to save my people by guiding them with an iron fist. Um, so, I don't know. I feel like there's kind of a difference there. Um... <laughs> I thought, um, this, this is just a really out there example, but, uh, if you've ever played, um, what's the game? Fable 3? Um. I've heard of it. This is a super meme -y game, and, like, everybody hated it. Uh, but one of the main points of the storyline was that, um, if you didn't, like, basically, like, not, if you didn't, like, tax the shit out of the people and, like, teach them to, like, take it in the ass, they would essentially all just die after, like, this giant war that you would inevitably have to prepare for, so... <laughs> uh, if, if you were nice to everyone, like, they all died. Oh, man. Yeah, so, like, if you had, like, this dishwater democracy of, like, <coughs> a monarchy, which was what the game was supposed to be, but um, you would just fail, and that, that would be it. Um, <laughs> and, like, at post-game, there would be, like, no one walking around, no one running the shops, no one in the farms, so it would just be you. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like that's just kind of a funny example. Um I guess no fucking around and whatnot, just get them. <laughs> Pretty much, I mean, no yeah. No more appeasement to pointless um, 
interest, po uh, pointless special interest and whatnot. You just gotta do what's best for the nation, basically. I feel like um, there's a quote by Rockwell where it's like, um, and this is not word for word, but it's like, um, love and peace are words used by like queers and Jews to like push their agenda. It's like they have <laughs> meaning. I don't know if he's a Jew, but it was definitely like implied. Um, so yeah, there's a there's this book has I mean a lot of it's <coughs> pretty to the point and like interesting and, and you know what's funny also about like um, a lot of times in the book he references the two party system as like a negative thing. Yeah, um, I think I said that before, but yeah, like he's very adamant that it's like it's just constant bickering and like fascists are men of action and de Democrats are people of talk. You know, the people of rabble, and even people who are like who who favor democracy, like they understand that it's super corrupt. I don't think that's an unfair assessment. You know, yeah. Like I feel like if you ask the average uh, Democrat or Republican, like, hey, so like, does this system actually work? And it's like, well, no. I mean, it's corrupt, but we're just picking the less of the two evils, and you know, it's the best way things have to be. And it's I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, I think that's kind of been force-fed to them, and they just believe that there's nothing else. Um, Currently, our political system is highly polarized, and I'm not really sure if that's ever going to change, or I think it might get more extreme as time goes on, because what we've entered generationally uh, is basically uh, um, we're transitioning from a time of... Um, Somebody put it really well. I think it was uh, the that feel win to intelligent man known as Kurt Doolittle, who, by the way, is actually incredibly intelligent. Incredible. Like I think he's a genius, but dude, the basement too intelligent. <laughs> uh, he's like super, super egotistical for one thing, but at the same time, he's really, really on point all the time, and he made a point that we we're currently transitioning from a generation of hopelessness to a generation that's basically I guess you could describe it as a kind of soft civil war. Oh, kind of. Yeah. Well, it's you know, the culture war as uh, a lot of people so eloquently put it. Yeah. Um, the culture and, war is now becoming physical. <laughs> yeah, well <laughs> Dude, race war now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it, it hasn't gotten that bad. I mean, it's I, there's a lot of altercations in the streets. It's almost like uh, 30s Berlin, where you, you see yeah. fascists and communists duking it out in the streets. I, I think mean, the, it's, not, it's not quite as unregulated. I think the it, only difference is that you know our nation is so large that we don't see them in the streets all the time because these people are so spread out. But we'll see what happens at Charlottesville. Oh, yeah, that'll be interesting. And that's important to and know. People are, like, super prepared that, like, shit's going to go down, like... The local news was reporting four thousand counter protesters. I don't. I don't, believe, I don't believe that. That's bullshit. Believe that. that is if bullshit. If there's four thousand, that's gonna. Be, oh, I believe that'll outnumber us one to four. And I. I yeah, but keep I in mind, it's gonna be like seventy percent women and like twenty percent people that can barely do anything, and then like yeah, ten I mean, percent giant brutes that can do something. So we'll I, see. You're, you're talking about like super fit, like yeah bench, like facing off against like women and like beta cucks like <laughs> yeah for the most part they're just gonna be screeching hurley so i wouldn't worry about it because it's kind of like what my uh mike enoch said on the recent daily show he's walked into the middle of cr these crowds of people and he's just laughed at them because it's nothing but screeching harlots and little faggots and <laughs> they can't do anything to him why would they do? Yeah, they, they would. like touch him and he, he, they get knocked out. Like I mean, occasionally, like somebody like hits him or something, but like, what does that do? Oh come on, yeah, like somebody hits you with a glitter bomb. Ha! Uh, yeah, good one, good one. I, fam. Wish, I wish I had drops for that. They have a perfect one on the Daily Show. It's just like a glittery sound, and it's for Richard Spencer, whatever he's mentioned. <laughs> but uh, oh yeah, these questions. This this one number sixteen gets me. How will you gain power? And he says by legal and constitutional means. Yeah, okay, cock. <laughs> yeah, okay, cock, yeah. <laughs> um, you know what the funniest one was? And this was the first question. Um, how do you feel about the crown, pretty much? Um, yeah. And it's just like, dude, utmost respect for the crown. And I'm like, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean. I think he was just saying that to kind of get on, you know, on people's good side. Because at the time, I believe that was. It's was kind of necessary to maintain the crown in some ways. It's like a. It, it's like a meme for British people. For the UK, it's like the, their traditional thing. I don't know. They've always had a royal family. 
I feel like, I mean, like, because that's, I, I don't want to say that that's the mistake that Mussolini made, but he also had someone to answer to, and I feel like if fascism as a system still has someone on top of it, um, it's just not going to work correctly. There's a lot of uh, monarchists and whatnot in the alt-right. I wonder how they feel about that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, honestly, I mean, I would say probably the difference is, that's actually a good question, but what would, what would, what would set, set fascism apart from a monarchy? And I mean... I would. A monarchy would, would be hereditary, for one thing. Yeah. Okay. So the that's, family would function as a firm that trains people to lead the country. I can I mean, see the arguments this, for that, for one thing. Right. So it would be hereditary, and there'd be a family, and they would lead the you know they'd lead the nation. Because for one um, thing, it's like you know you got this like community sir, organizer, this lawyer who just ran for office one day, and on the other hand, you have somebody that was trained from birth to lead. Right. And, it really I makes mean, you wonder. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that's also... It's not necessarily something that fascism advocates for, but basically the way Mosley is explaining it, it would work is that there are all these different... Um, not parliaments, or there's basically these committees for every sort of profession in society, and um, they decide what's best for the nation. So um, the way that leadership is um, gained in one of those committees is that you're, you're basically, if you're the best at your trade, you end up rising to the top of that committee. Um, so, I mean, I guess that would be a difference, you know, like, <coughs> everyone's raised to uh, sort of lead, I guess, and whoever leads the best, essentially, would, would become the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of it being hereditary, it's ingrained in everyone, it's not like serfdom, um, I almost feel like monarchy, um, I, I don't know if it keeps people on lower rungs less intelligent. I, I don't know if that's something. I, I guess that it would... depends on how you organize the system. I mean, feudalism certainly was like, it had a feudal system, but I don't believe that's necessary for a monarchy, and I don't know how exactly that would function in the modern day. Kind of beats me. I mean, if you're not using serfdom labor, how, how, how does one person maintain an entire sort of uh, class structure, you know? Well, it's kind of like how it was discussed in um, the book written by Hope. Um, what's the title again? Democracy, the God that Failed. Oh, man. <laughs> I've he heard a lot about that book. Yeah, here it's pretty good. And basically, he argues that he would prefer a system like anarcho-capitalism, but he says that monarchy is preferable to democracy. Oh. Because primarily, be, and I believe one of the points he made is that in a monarchy... The entire nation is privately owned by one family, therefore it is most certainly in their interest to make sure that the country works out. Right, so it's like, works. oh, well, you know, this is my property, so I might want to get a warranty out on it, I might want to keep it in good shape, uh, you know, and it'll serve me well as long as I take care of it. Um, I kind of, maybe maybe almost like a, uh, like a prized possession sort of thing. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, um, in fascism, it's more like... Instead of private ownership, it's collective in a sense. It's like it is the collective. nation is the people. The, the nation is the people. The people is the nation. Uh, the leader is the people. The, le the people are the leader, and so on and so forth. It's like a well. It's like the strongest people are the leaders. Yeah, kind of. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly they will find their way somewhere into the most influential systems. Well, we can hope that that doesn't become subversive. Exactly. There would I have mean, to be safety measures. Again, although fascism is a good transitionary stage as well, I don't know, you know. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I think compared to what we have now, it's probably, it would probably work out better. Probably. Um, I mean, considering the kind of people that would advocate for something like that, especially in our country. If, it, mean, if it is used as a transitionary stage, then it's especially good for question 11 here. Will there be freedom of the press under fascism and will... Oh, I love this question. Yes, and will Go newspapers on, be free it. to criticize the government? Fundamentally, um, I love that first sentence right there. The press will not be free to tell lies. I love it. Dude, that's like your fake news, but it's a law. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it's true. I mean, like, a lot of these um, sort of, you know, these um, news outlets are in the pocket of, you know, corporations who pay them to sort of spew lies, and that's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. I mean, if... If something like that was true in the 30s and we haven't fixed it it's far years worse. ago... Like, it's far worse now than ever. Yeah. Oh, God, isn't it? I mean, oh, yeah. Cor corporatism? No, corporatism is fascism, but... 
Well, um, yeah, the I, think co- I think the current uh, corporatism is far worse than whatever fascism was trying to advocate. Well, it's it, you know what it is? <laughs> it's it's that um, capitalism has been used. Um, it's been it's not used by fact. It's not used by the people. It's capitalism uses the people rather than the, <coughs> the people using capitalism. As a means to an end, and he talks about right. That. What happened is um, what's happening right now is we have this like mass consumerism where, <laughs> and you know that's also kind of led to outsourcing, which is something yeah. else that he talks about is that you just basically ban all <laughs> exports and foreign trade. Um, not not ban them, but like he, he has a couple questions on it. But um, basically, what he's talking about, if it doesn't benefit people, then like imports and exports should just be completely eliminated, and we should just focus on uh, British goods. You know, uh, and that's something I almost feel like Trump is sort of working on. You know, bringing He's jobs trying, back. To I feel like uh, I feel like Trump is basically trying to balance out our our trade imbalance because we have massive imports but very little exports. So he's trying to balance that out. Well, yeah, I know there's this there's this running gag about American manufacturing, and it's like, yeah. oh, everything you make falls apart, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and if if we could just get away from that, that would be. If we could improve the quality of our goods, I, and again, I think I mentioned this before, I think that there is a trend where businesses are coming back to the United States, but I'm not sure how fast that's happening. I'm not sure how true not it is. Not fast enough. Yeah, I mean, I was that was when I was in college and I was hearing all this news about how it's becoming too expensive to have people, you know, have these, uh, you know, to, uh, what is it, um, outsource work to other countries now. It's actually becoming incredibly expensive, so they may have to actually come back here. Just we'll based on that. profit. Just based on profit alone, but they should be, <laughs> personally, I think they should be made to do it regardless. Oh, Even, precisely. I mean, profit's a very, sort of, it, it's a lowly goal, you know? Like, if that's uh, all you're chasing, then you... For them, it's like... You're going to be empty inside. It's all that truly matters for them, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the bottom dollar, that's that's what our society's created, though. It's, it's created a perpetual sort of desire just to make money and that's it yeah. uh, and that's that's an issue i mean that's a problem. it's part of the reason that our whole society is falling apart at the seams now oh yeah and um i think people need to start realizing that like let me have my free trade but it's it's not it's not the only it's not the only end all be all you know yeah Voting. <laughs> People seem to also value their right to vote a lot. I honestly think it should be restricted heavily. I'm just not sure exactly how. Oh, I mean, the face of Jewish challenge would make everyone take an IQ test. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, could you think of a better way of doing it? I mean, how do you have people who are um, well versed on issues, left or right, whatever, um, <coughs> to make clear and coherent decisions that will, you know? inevitably um, create the future of the nation, you know? How do you yeah. make sure that people are creating, you know, making the right decisions for that? Exactly. It's like, how do you... Because I don't know, because then somebody just... You know, the founding there. fathers are talking about this 300 years yeah, ago. They, they wanted, yeah, they wanted uh, an educated population, that they could, a populace that could understand the core issues and was capable of voting on those issues. But then again, back then, who could vote? Uh, white males with property. <laughs> and slaves. Hmm? Dude, slaves. And they had slaves. Oh, yeah, they had slaves, too, but... I mean, that was almost like an elite thing to have at the time, to be honest. Yeah, but, like, like I'm oh, saying, have like, slaves. the only people that could really vote were... Were those kind of people. It was, like, yeah. more uh, upper-class people. Which wasn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Well, right, I mean, if you own property, you can vote like that. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're smart enough to hold down a job and have children and, you know, have a, have a house, you probably are smart enough to vote. <laughs> Here's an idea. Uh, bare minimum of three children. <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, let's pay every, every every white person to have three kids. Yeah, like That's give them some sort weird. of like government reward or something. Well, I mean, if, if you African Americans get affirmative action, I, I don't see why it's <laughs> unfair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so we've been discussing uh, the hundred questions and whatnot. Uh, we also... We kind of already discussed really anything that's going on with Sean Spicer. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we didn't really discuss that ADL article, though. Oh, the ADL article. Yeah, let's get to that real quick. Um, I don't basically, have it in front of me, but... Um, 
I'm, I'm going to have to let you take the lead on this one. Yeah, very, well, basically okay. it's pretty straightforward. They're talking about, from uh, yeah, the title is uh, From Alt-Right to Alt-Light, Naming the Hate. This is a list of people. Way they. Yeah, they pretty much, well, they get it almost right from their perspective. There's a clear difference between the Alt-Right and Alt-Light, and it's basically, they even quote Greg Johnson, which is pretty interesting. Greg Johnson is a contributor to the Alt-Right. To the alt right, and he says here, uh, yeah, he describes difference in his way. Uh, the alt right, the alt light, is defined by civic nationalism as opposed to racial nationalism. So there you go. That's a pretty straightforward, clear cut difference between the alt right and the alt light. And so, that's starting, the main difference, I would say. Yeah, that's the main difference. They're starting to get the difference here, and they're starting to understand they're dealing with two different groups. But the article basically states that they're all bigots anyway. <laughs> Oh, great. Good job. <laughs> They're all lumped in anyway, which is kind of a core point that the alt light really needs to wrap around its head, no matter how hard they try to differentiate themselves from, or distance themselves from um, the alt right. They're still going to be lumped in the same thing anyway. So well, really sure they are. Matter. and that, All that's going to do is just make them look farther right, you know? So, I almost feel like that's what's going to happen. <laughs> well, if they're calling me a Nazi anyway, I wonder what the Nazis have to say about it. Yeah, it's like the guy who was on the Daily Show, uh, the last episode, this guy is a well-known, the guest speaker was a, is a well-known rock mu musician, believe it or not, rap rock or something. Right. He's very well-known, surprisingly. I think he's been on tour with, like, I don't know if he's been on tour with, like, <laughs> these guys, what do they call them? Ah, uh, the dudes that go, uh, whoop, whoop, what is it? Oh, the insane clown posse. Yeah, I think he know. I think he know. For he all know, my brothers and sisters out there? I think he's linked to those guys, but I think he's been on oh, tour God. with other people. So this is actually a pretty big deal, but he recently made um, a music video uh, called Nazi, where he's just oh. like, and basically he's like, well, I guess I'm a Nazi, and he, <laughs> he's basically gone full-blown alt-right, and that's pretty great. Dude, that's great. I mean, you see a lot of bands actually taking that up, um, and you also so. see a lot yeah. of bands taking the opposition route. Um, what was, uh, what was that? <laughs> Those you, guys. Uh, what they called? Oh, Straight from the Path. That's oh, what they were called. Oh, no, that video. Like, was... yeah, you just got knocked the fuck out it's just like talking about like home invasions of like <coughs> national socialists and like the dude had like a giant portrait of spencer right yeah right that was amazing Ozzie. i'm like i don't think anyone has that in their living room uh, <laughs> one day one day it will be legally required yeah dude legally required picture photo of spencer in your in your living room right next to the swazi <coughs> all right let's get to the list i'm pretty all right it starts of course with Andrew Anglin from the Daily Stormer. He runs that. That's all his big shit. And of course, it talks about Andrew Arnheimer, who is uh, AKA Weave. And Weave, Weave, I believe, is also. Yeah, I think he writes for the Daily Stormer. But he's most well known for this. He uh, hacks um, printers and fax machines all across the United States, particularly at universities. They're networked together, and he prints out anti-Semitic flyers. Oh, that's too good. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. He's done this prank a thousand times, I think, or several times. It's very good. I don't know. But I, like, can you even get mad at that? Like, oh, no, he's committing a computer crime. And it's it's like, technically not even out. illegal. Like, he it is. I mean, it's, a it's technically a computer crime, but, like... No, no, he says, uh, apparently, technically, it's not It's not illegal. He's consulted lawyers about that. Oh, shit. <laughs> so you can do that. but <laughs> So if, if you have the uh, technical ability, for anyone listening, go go print out, go go hack it. You might want to consult a lawyer or two before you do it, but yeah, yeah, it might be possible to In your, in your particular state, it, implying it varies from state to state. We do not advocate illegal things in yes, the United no, we Front, don't. but... Do not so advocate consult violence a lawyer or before, illegal computer crime. So, so consult a lawyer, but... <laughs> Please consult the lawyer before you do anything. That's my disclaimer. Um, so who else was on the lineup? Uh, Andy Nowicki. Nowicki? And, and just for anyone who is unfamiliar, we're talking about Charlottesville here, correct? No, not necessarily. Um, this is just an ADL article. But they, oh, okay, so the, this is a list of people that Just a list of people who happen to be okay. in the alt-right and alt-light. Uh, some of these so people are going to show up. A lot of these people are going to show up. Honestly, the only really... <coughs> And I don't even know if I can call um, one of them all light. Is uh, Augustus Invictus? I don't think he's. I he's, wouldn't call him he's alt, -right, on, he's or a, alt light. He's a balance between alt light and alt right. He almost seems like that. Yeah. <coughs> and then Gavin McInnes. Um, he's alt light. He's, uh, he's alt light. Yes, he's alt light as fuck. Yeah. Um, I the, I do remember there was some kind of um, 
leaked messages about uh, him like actually cooperating with uh, quote unquote white supremacists now. Though. Now I like, I saw that, but I'm not sure if that was a real leak because I saw it and it, it had Mike Enoch talking in it as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if those two even converse. It's kind of hard to say. I I'm mean, sure they have, but I'm it, not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I can't see. I can't see Gavin saying that in a in a private message like that and it getting leaked. Something tells me that was fake. I don't know. It probably was. I mean, the dude seems pretty set in his ways, but you never know. Yeah. Now this next guy is Andy Nowicki. I think that's how his name is pronounced. Um, but he's. I don't know, he's some writer for the, um, he appears to be a writer for altright.com and an editor on the site. And of course, yeah, as you mentioned, Augustus Invictus is mentioned next. Perfect. <laughs> we all know about Augustus, and he's a cool yeah, guy. Yeah, he's great. I mean, I've talked to him on a couple occasions, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's a nice enough guy, he's a swell enough guy. He's a swell enough guy, he's a good enough guy, I'm a normal <laughs> guy. But when I get a little sugar in my system, I start to get a little wacky. <laughs> and enough enough uh, Sam Hyde for one day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and th- th- this guy, uh, this next guy's named Brad Griffin, a.k.a. Hunter Wallace. Okay, so he works with, I believe he's behind you, yeah, Os- Occidental Dissident, which is a good, excellent blog, and I highly recommend checking it out. I'll definitely will. Yeah, and he's a good writer and all that. There a lot of, there's a lot of great blogs out there that really need more attention. Uh, let's see. Of course, Christopher Cantwell, if you've ever heard of him. Oh, yes. The uh, ANCAP um, white supremacist, right? The, well, the white ANCAP, the ANCAP, the, uh, ANCAP turned fascist, basically. <laughs> he, he's Got the host of Radical Agenda, and that's a pretty good show. It's a pretty good show. Radical Agenda. Yeah, I, I've only, I think I listened to a uh, Red Ice radio piece on him at least once. Um, yeah, yeah him, I think I, he, I would he was have... on there. He was on there. He was on Red Ice yeah, at least once. Yeah, that was the one. That's the one I'm talking about. Um, that interview with him. But uh, yeah. So all these people are on the list then. That should be. Uh... There's also Colin Dell. He's he's a writer for Alternative Right. Uh, Daniel Freiberg. He's a Swedish businessman, white quote unquote white supremacist, and also an editor on AltRight.com. But he's the CEO and co-founder of Arcos, or is it? Arctos, yeah, Arctos, media. And this is all out, out of this uh, ADL piece? Yeah, out of this article. Piece. Basically, it's a lot of people. Some of these people I don't actually recognize, so... Oh! Dylan Irizarry, if that's how you pronounce his name. A military ve- veteran who is the leader of the group Vanguard America. Oh, oh, they actually have a name for him. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that this was the guy. Now, he's bragging here... It says here that he, um, in one speech, he basically boasted that, that uh, uh, his group basically had 200 members in 20 different states. Something tells me that Vanguard has way more than 200 members now. I think the number is at 3,000. It I has to be. That's their that's their uh, current member count. Maybe it's gotten a little larger since I last. I checked. would I would think so because this pi- that he's talking about where he's talking about having um, approximately 200 members. This was at Pikeville. And the thing is that the Pikeville um, event was only a couple of months ago, so the idea that somehow he expanded from 200 to 3,000, something tells me that ADL isn't telling the truth here. They're probably not. I mean, <coughs> honestly, I mean, they, they seem to pick up members pretty quick. Like, um, yeah. I don't know, maybe a couple months after you hear from them, if you're eligible to join, you'll probably end up joining. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with a couple members, but um, yeah, that's the only really reason I know. That much, at least. <sighs> All right, so the next one is Greg Johnson, and of course he's not. He's still an alt right writer, but he and Spencer have had a falling out over accusations regarding Daniel Freiberg and other things. There's a big bit of a drama spat between him and a lot of alt right people. Of course, uh, the next person is a uh, still he's a good writer, and he has a lot of good uh, material. He He's the editor in chief at Countercurrents Publishing. Uh, basically, treat this list as an excellent referral <laughs> list. Right. Okay. So you know who exactly who to uh, look up. Who to go uh, look up. Who to read from. Who to whose <laughs> books to buy. Everything. This is yeah. an excellent referral list. Uh, for some people, it may even be an excellent dating list. Uh, <laughs> oh man. 
Yeah, well, uh, good job on ADL for compiling a, uh, a listening and reading list for some of our, uh, <laughs> some people who are curious about it, the movement as a whole. Now, of course, I also mentioned Jared Taylor, and we all know about Jared Taylor. Jared Taylor. Yeah. He runs the American Renaissance website and the conference and all that stuff. He's a, he's excellent. He, he has a lot of information on race realism. Which is uh, always important. That's kind of... He's like first a key one. figure to the alt-right, major important, super uh, professional. And yeah, I mean, like I'd, I'd highly recommend checking out his uh, website, his uh, YouTube videos. Especially now, the next person is Jason Kessler. Oh, okay. He's. All I think. Right. I think he, this is the guy who's uh, organizing the Char- Charleston event. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. No, Charlottesville. I mean, Charleston, Charlottesville. <laughs> Getting yeah. all these things mixed up. Next guy, I don't really recognize. I think it's just another guy from AltRight.com, Jason Reza Georgiani. Yeah, I think he's another arc. Arctos media guy. Um, <laughs> right below him is uh, Johnny Monoxide. Oh, I actually just listened to something on him today. Um. The par- he's the he uh, is the host of the Paranormies present the Enerbe Hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where they talk about spooky stuff and conspiracies and whatnot. I mean that guy. Um, if you listen to uh, if you listen to him, like. Was very into um, sort of like conspiracy theories before, but um, oh, yeah. you know, like the nine eleven truth movement and all that. And what really, uh, what really brought him into the the current scene was that um, it seemed like almost uh, how do I call it World War Two revisionism. It was like taboo is like fuck, but there were so many conspiracy theories floating around about it. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, he like... eventually just came around to the idea that there might be more to it. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. Yeah, I mean, if he's like. If you're into conspiracy stuff, eventually you're going to hit the Jewish question somewhere. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's I, I, I've said this a couple times, but I'll say it again. Um, the only difference between like a Nazi and an anarchist is that the 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 Nazi recognizes that the Jews are you know the, the corporate elite and um, the ones controlling the media and pretty much this spooky enemy that the anarchist uh, doesn't really have a label for outside of oh it's the Rothschilds. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm fairly certain. Um, the Rothschilds are a Jewish family, but I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure they are. I'm not sure how, I'm not sure if they really have as much influence as people say. I'm not sure, uh, of the details on that, but, you know, they they might. I don't know. (laughs) Um, but, yeah, okay, so, there's Johnny. Johnny's a pretty cool dude. Uh, there's, uh, of course, there's, uh, they mentioned Lena Lochteff from uh, Red Ice. Oh yeah, she's. Uh, I've listened to a couple of her pieces. She's she's pretty good. Red very, Ice. Uh, highly recommend very Red Eyes. Based. <laughs> um, highly recommend Red Eyes. Highly recommend it. Very. It's very good. It's very it's uh, professional. It's very. Um, it's enjoyable to listen to, and I mean, it's um, it's all about. It's just a really good radio program, to be honest. I'm wondering if it would really be necessary to mention this uh, guy here, but you know, I'm gonna do it anyway. He's a bit of a controversial, controversial figure within the alt right, but David Duke. No, no, no. D- Duke <laughs> is great. I'll mention Duke all the time. I don't think he's mentioned on here. I don't think it's necessary to mention. I Duke. mean, he was in the cake I gave for like four years, and that's all he's known for. <laughs> oh, he's known for a lot of things after that. He's he ran for uh, Louisiana Senate, Senate, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's been out there for a long time. He's he's an OG, OG guy. He's an OG alt writer, boy. Yeah, he was there long before everyone else was, but this next guy is Matt Forney, who, um, he's not well-liked from the alt-right, but I've heard that a lot of his writings are pretty good, but there's just a lot of shit storms between him and other people, so I well, guess... Why he, would he, uh, why would he, why would, why do we, why would he be disliked? What's the, <laughs> what's the, uh, nuance to that? I don't, wa- I don't want to, like, shit-talk the guy on our podcast or anything, it's just that he's, like... He's got a lot of controversy surrounding him. I guess it's mainly because before he became alt right, he was very a little different. He wrote, he wrote some sort of book about how to pick up Filipino women or something or Thai women or whatever. I'm not sure what exactly what the focus oh, was. Come on, you're not born red pilled. I mean, you can't blame people for thinking. Yeah, people were like, they, they listened to, to a speech he gave in Sweden, and they were like, 
and I give the guy a break. He's really come around. He, he's really coming to his own. But then that was. Should you be praising those kind of people, the ones that are so far gone that they just they end up coming to these conclusions? I have no um, idea. But those are the kind of people that you want to <laughs> sort of put on a pedestal, you know? Like even these people think that sort of way, you know? Like things have gotten so bad that even the super degenerates even feel like it's gone too far. Yeah. <laughs> like that. That should be something to be champion. I think. Um, I think at least it's a curiosity that people should certainly look into. If if literally anybody and everybody in society can think something's wrong and they start to notice what's wrong, then yeah, something's up. Oh, yeah. Um, now, I... <laughs> oh my God, this dude. Uh, okay, some of, some of the writings from Matt Forney. Let me read some of the titles that apparently he's written. How to Beat Your Girlfriend or Wife and Get Away With It. Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Good evening, I hate women. <laughs> uh, the myth of female intelligence. Oh my god. This guy's interesting. Okay, I really need to read this stuff because oh, okay. he's got interesting stuff. Uh, the next guy is Matthew Heimbach. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, he's the leader he's of the traditional, traditional workers party. Yeah, he's the leader of that party. Um, excellent dude. Um, great material. He's the guy... That everybody goes and interviews and thinks, oh, it's just going to be this rural hick. And he's going to be stupid. And then they get in the interview and guess what? Roasted. Why did you just got roasted? Fucking roasted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> highly intelligent, highly articulate, knows exactly what to say, when to say. Very smart That's dude. perfect. That's someone you need on your side. Oh, yeah. This is a great dude. Like, yeah. He's also, I think he's a Eastern Orthodox guy. That's one of the curious things about... Trad youth and his group and whatnot is that they're orthodox religiously. Interesting. Which is, I don't know. It's like, it's an interesting aspect to their, to their particular it's party. Unique. A very, a very unique aspect because it's a, it's a national socialist party, but with a religious twist. Interesting. And for a while they were calling themselves socialist nationalists, but now they've just completely moved on to national socialism. I guess. <laughs> <coughs> it's pretty great. Yeah, good shit, my dude. Oh, yeah. And uh, let's see here, Matthew Parrott. Okay, now that's co-founder of that political party. Oh, he's the, oh, he's the son-in-law of Matthew Heimbach. That's interesting. Wow, uh, that's kind of strange. No, it's kind of cool, actually. Well, I mean, not strange in a bad way. It's uh, different. It's interesting. Uh, he actually does have a great log organs, but we should probably wrap this up at some point. Yeah. Um, um, needless to say, the other people on this list, Mike Enoch, we all know about him, Nathan Domingo, the leader of the um, ID in Europa, yeah. Pax Dixon, other people like that. Was that Jason Domingo or Nathan Domingo? Nathan Domingo, yeah. Richard Spencer, of course, we all know about oh, Richard God. Spencer. Tara, Mac Tara McCarthy, she has a great um, YouTube channel, I think it's called Reality Calls? I'm not sure. Fox Day. Day. <laughs> Baked Alaska's on here. Of course, oh, they, yeah, mentioned, for sure. they mentioned the alt light as well, but I don't think it's worth mentioning the alt light. Not really. I mean, there, there really isn't anything worth mentioning. No, there really isn't. But yeah, this is um, basically all there is right now. Um, yeah, I guess we could just go ahead and wrap it up, and then we can have. All right. Yeah. What would you like to discuss next, Joe? I don't know. I guess we'll have to figure that out as we go along, because I'm sure there's going to be big news at some point in the near future. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we'll see you after Charlottesville. That should be a really fun show. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> we can go in-depth on our experience. Well, I think we're going to have, like, one more show right before that. We'll see. Right. No, we will. So, uh, stay tuned for more. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, have a wonderful day, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, peace be upon you. All right. <laughs> All right.